Hi everyone, welcome back to Lecture 7L of Useful Genetics, where we're going to talk about how to use a mating square to predict the outcome of a cross. And we'll talk about when to use a mating square and how to choose the right mating square. So here's our cross that we diagrammed in the previous lecture with fish producing large pools of gametes that are allowed to mix together, come together randomly, and give the progeny genotypes. And the way we're going to illustrate how the gametes come together is using this square, which is called a mating square, or sometimes a Punnett square. So here's your first genetics problem. We want to predict the offspring both the genotypes and the frequencies of these genotypes in the offspring of a cross between two parents, and both parents have the simple genotype big A little a. So we're going to use a mating square, and the, that square diagram accomplishes several things. It represents the physical aspects of mating, the physical coming together of the gametes, and it represents the informational aspects of the mating, the actual genotypes of those gametes. It, in doing so, it makes it easy to predict what the genotype of each kind of progeny is going to be. It also makes it easy to keep track of the proportions, as you'll see. The one, comp one factor to remember, though, is that you have to first predict the gamete genotypes before you can use the mating square. So, what are the gamete genotypes for this cross? So this is a very simple cross, and it's easy to predict the gamete types. The parents are both genotype big A, little a. They can only produce two kinds of gametes, big A gametes and little a gametes, and they're each going to represent half of the total gametes. So we can write the gamete types into the sides of the square. One parent's gamete genotypes on the side, the other parent's gamete genotypes on the top. In this case, they're identical, but they certainly don't need to be. And then the gametes can come together, and we see the genotypes of the offspring represented simply by filling in the squares with the gamete genotypes. So we have big A, big A genotypes, little a, little a genotypes, and two squares of heterozygous genotypes. Now, the square also indicates proportions because by giving equal spaces to the um, spacing compartments on the sides and the top, we remind ourselves that the gametes are going to be present in equal proportions, equal proportions of big A and little a. And that means that we can then use the area of the squares that contain the offspring genotypes as measures of the proportion of each of those genotypes. So now I've written in the proportions of each combination that's been produced. And you can see that we have one quarter AA, one big A, big A, one quarter little a, little a, and two quarters of the heterozygous genotypes. So we can write out the results of the cross as one quarter big A, big A, one quarter little a, little a, and one half big A, little a. Now, here I've got big A, little a, here I've got little a, big A. Those are the same genotype. Okay, that was a simple problem. Here's a more complicated genotype for the parents. Again, both parents have got the same genotype, um, but now we're considering two genes, and the parents are heterozygous for both genes, and the genes are on different chromosomes. How are you going to illustrate this meeting? What kind of a mating square will you use? I've shown three examples here, and your challenge is to figure out which one is appropriate. And what you need to remember is that in order to decide what kind of square you want to draw, 
you need to have decided what the gametes will be because it's the properties of the gametes that determine the kind of square that's appropriate. So, what, oh, so the first thing is, what are the gamete types and proportions going to be? The answer is that you're going to have four different kinds of gametes in equal proportion, a quarter each of big A, big B, big A, little b, little A, big B, and little A, little b. Now we're in a position to choose our mating square. And the answer is only three is appropriate because it's got the four genotypes of two genes with both the A and the B alleles present in each gamete. This um, square two would never be appropriate because we wouldn't have gametes that only had allele gene A or only had gene B. All of the gametes are going to have gene A and gene B. Okay, we know what our gametes are. We know what our mating square has to look like, and I'm going to leave it to you to figure out what the offspring genotypes are. You know how to use a mating square. You know to pool the, gam the offspring that are of the same genotype, and so I'll leave you to work out the answer. So what we've done, we've used mating squares to diagram mating, also called fertilization, and I've pulled the mating square apart and put it in the larger context of a cross to help you realize that the mating square is only part of the cross. The other part is determining what gametes you're going to get from the parents. Then the mating square tells you what offspring you will get from the gametes. We've worked at choosing the right mating square and at then predicting progeny genotypes from the gamete genotypes. Coming up next, we're going to do three problems where we put together what we've learned about predicting gamete frequencies through meiosis and predicting offspring frequencies in mating to follow alleles through a complete generation. I hope to see you there.